Good day and welcome to Mission Control Houston. Today is a Thursday, September 5, 2013, and this is Space Station Live. Here in the Mission Control Center, the team is watching over the activities of the Expedition 36 crew aboard the International Space Station. Uh, Commander Pavel Vinogradov, of course, continuing to work with uh, NASA astronauts Chris Cassidy and Karen Nyberg, uh, his Russian colleagues Fyodor Shikin and Alexander Mazurkin, and uh, European Space Agency astronaut Luca Parmitano to conduct important research and maintain the International Space Station. We're starting our day today just a little bit late due to that uh, interview by Chris Cassidy capacity, and we'll have an opportunity later in the day to uh, replay that for you. Today's uh, activities are focused on uh, more work with the SPHERES experiment. SPHERES stands for Synchronized Position, Hold, Engage, Reorient Experimental Satellites, and the idea is to look at how uh, small satellites can uh, orient one another relative to themselves in microgravity. Uh, it's a very interesting experience, experiment that actually had the genesis in the uh, uh, training droids that were used in the Star Wars original Star Wars movie, and that was developed by the folks at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology into this experiment. Today's work is uh, adding on some additional complexity to the SPHERES experiment uh, with a smartphone uh, helping to uh, do the controlling and operations of the SPHERES. Uh, there are a lot of potential applications for this uh, set of uh, small satellites, uh, both inside and outside the space station, uh, one of which might be to use it as a uh, personal assistant that could uh, theoretically follow a crew member around uh, within the space station and uh, be able to uh, allow them to access data and information about the activities that they need to perform uh, or uh, about uh, uh, communications activities, any kind of work that the crew might be doing at that time. They might have a little personal assistant that uh, could be on the spot to help them out or provide uh, some camera work over the shoulder, whatever, and we're testing whether smartphones could be used to do some of that activity. In addition, uh, there's some uh, maintenance work, uh, plumbing, if you will, for uh, Chris Cassidy on the schedule today. He's scheduled to be uh, beginning soon uh, to replace an air valve uh, in the carbon dioxide removal system in the Tranquility module. Uh, that uh, system, uh, that valve has been sticking for a while, uh, and uh, Mission Control has been able to uh, work around the issue in terms of getting rid of the excess carbon dioxide inside the station atmosphere. Uh, but it's time now to replace that valve and see if we can't get the uh, uh, device to operate a little bit more smoothly uh, without a lot of additional management. Uh, there are a couple of different carbon dioxide removal systems on the space station. One is on the U.S. side. One is on the Russian side. They use uh, similar but differently designed equipment that provides what we call uh, uh, dissimilar redundancy so that uh, if one system fails for a specific reason, uh, you don't necessarily have all of the uh, systems that support carbon dioxide removal uh, fall at failing at the same time. So that will be worked out. Of course, the carbon dioxide removal system, uh, as you breathe, you uh, inhale oxygen and nitrogen and you exhale carbon dioxide. Uh, this uh, gets rid of the excess carbon dioxide and is also tied into some systems, uh, the Sabatier, that are trying to eke a little bit more water recycling out of uh, the atmosphere on the space station as well. The uh, Japanese HTV-4 cargo ship, which uh, uh, departed from the International Space Station 11.20 a.m. Central Time yesterday, uh, continues to phase away from the space station following yesterday's unberthing and release. It is scheduled to fire its uh, engines to begin a destructive deorbit at 1.36 a.m. Central Time Saturday. Uh, NASA and the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, which provided the cargo vehicle uh, for the space station program, are working together to gather extensive data data and imagery of the re-entry, including some gathered by the crew and some uh, by the ISERV science camera, which usually is applied to photo photographing natural disasters on Earth, but we'll be attempting to uh, see if we can use that to provide some uh, new data collection on exactly how items that are commanded to re-enter the Earth uh, do so. Uh, Pavel Vinogradov, Chris Cassidy, and Alexander Mazurkin are also continuing to uh, load items and get ready for their departure uh, in the TMA-08M Soyuz spacecraft. Uh, they're supposed to undock and land on the steppe of Kazakhstan next Tuesday. As we watch uh, the uh, coverage 
Uh, we're going to be having hatch closure coverage at uh, 3 p.m. Central Time, uh, undocking coverage beginning at 6.15 p.m. Central Time, and landing coverage beginning at 8.45 p.m. Central Time, and we expect landing at 9.59 p.m. Central Time. Uh, after they have departed the space station, that leaves room for the next crew members to come up to the space station. Expedition 37 and 38 Prime crew members Mike Hopkins, Ola Kotov, and Sergei Rozanski are conducting their final round of Soyuz vehicle qualification exams today at the Gagarin Cosmonaut Training Center in Star City, Russia. A few photos of the trio as they uh, get ready to depart uh, uh, for the uh, final preparations for launch. Meeting executives uh, from the uh, uh, Russian Federal Space Agency getting ready to depart. Signing follow, fo final qualification documents. Again, Hopkins, uh, Kotov, and Rozunsky are uh, scheduled to launch to the International Space Station on September 25, and they're making final preparations uh, at the training center in Star City now. That's what's going on aboard the International Space Station on Thursday, September 5, 2013. This is Mission Control Houston. We were expecting it on um, SUP 2. J03. Okay, I can but, swap um, it. It's no problem. Either way, there is one uh, uh, one J that is uh, one outlet that is uh, on that is not needed. That that's what I'm saying. Copy that, Luca, and uh, we can leave it up to you. So one info for you would be that um, SSC11 can stay on SUP2 J02 as long as it is wireless. Once that's not the case, it must go back to um, J03. Okay, uh, I can swap it. If, all, all I need to do is swap the swap the the power cable, so it's not a big deal. Uh, what once I swap it back to J03, what do you want me to do with J02? You want you want you want it to stay powered even though there is nothing connected to it. And um, Luca, we can uh, switch it off once it's swapped uh, when you tell us. Unit station J03 is now powering SSC 11, and J02 is empty and uh, the cobble brick, brick is unpowered. And uh, Luca, we copied all. Thank you very much. And uh, we are going to switch off um, J02 then. And um, when you're ready to copy for the uh, LHA r, r we have some more words for you on that. Ready right now. Okay, Luca, so for the LHA r, &R this is a ESA SODF procedure IFM corrective EPDS 2 decimal 402, call MLU lamp housing assembly r, &R and um, that would be all steps to be performed. For the storage note, um, the item for Retrieving the LHA uh, spare is uh, in um, PMM1, Sierra 4, Golf 2. And for the resto of the failed LHA, it will be also PMM1 end cone um, in the JSB serial number 4035. I'll copy. The procedure 2.402, new one, it will be in Starboard 4, Golf 2 in PMM, and the, the failed one will go in JSP 4035. 
and uh, Luca, let's uh, put the read back, and uh, if you need some assistance on the tools, uh, we're standing by for you. And, uh, we are going to save um, the last MLUs for you. Uh, we'll get back when the saving is in place. Session. Whenever you're ready, you can go. I'm I'm ready to remove uh, to to remove or replace the LHA right now. And uh, Luca, we copy that. Um, we are just about to uplink the command to save the aft MLU lights. And uh, once the aft light string is off, um, you can proceed with uh, the R and R. I noticed. And um, Luca Munich, uh, we copied that you confirmed that memory user are off. Sir, memory user off. Okay, copy that, Luca, and uh, you can proceed with your procedure. Thanks in advance. This is Mission Control Houston. Uh, crew members aboard the International Space Station talking with the uh, Space Station Integration and Promotion Center in Scuba, Japan, uh, part of one of the many control centers that helps control the activities aboard the International Space Station as it uh, orbits uh, currently at an altitude of about 250 statute miles uh, over the uh, northern Atlantic Ocean, about to make a southeasterly crossing of uh, the Iberian Peninsula and the African continent. Uh, let you know we're going to have a special guest here in Mission Control in uh, just a few minutes. Uh, Doug Hurley, uh, astronaut and the uh, husband of uh, Expedition 36 uh, flight engineer Karen Nyberg uh, is in Mission Control with us today. Uh, we are going to be uh, kicking off a, a series of uh, video vignettes about the uh, softer side of space. Uh, Karen Nyberg has a lot of varied interests, uh, and she is uh, attempting to uh, uh, keep up with those while she's in orbit. Uh, one of the things that these vignettes also look at is family life aboard uh, the International Space Station and, and how it uh, can be hard or also fairly easy to keep in touch with your family uh, on the ground when you're doing a long duration expedition in space. Uh, this couple is unique in uh, the fact that it's uh, they both know what it's like to live in space and have both been there. And uh, so we'll talk, uh, we'll first watch this video vignette of Karen Nyberg uh, and uh, the, the family side of her life in orbit. And then we'll talk to Doug Hurley immediately afterward here in Mission Control about the Earth-based side of that. Let's take a look at the video now. Everybody worries that it's a long time to be away from your family and, and off the planet. Um, how do you feel about it? Well, it is a long time, and it's something that that part of it I am not looking forward to. But I'm not the only person, I'm not the first astronaut to have left to leave children and a spouse, and I'm not the first person in other careers. We have military families that every day are leaving their families to go to places that I wouldn't want to go and they have to leave their children behind and sometimes they don't know how long it's going to be. We know it's going to be a six month time on space station. A lot of these people don't know how long it will be. They don't know the outcome of their trip and so so it's it's certainly not heroic for me to be leaving my family. People do it all the time and um, I think it's something that a lot of families um, deal with um, and have ways of dealing with it and we just um, deal with it the same way. It's still not fun, but it, it's comforting to know that I'm not the only person in the world that is, is suffering with this, so. It, it's bothersome, you know, nobody wants to leave their child for that long. But I know that time will go quickly 
and I'll be back before you know it. And, um, and he's going to do great here. He'll do great with his dad. It'll be great bonding for them, if nothing else. But, but it is hard. And I, I'm actually, it's nice that there are others that have done it that I can look to to say, what did you do? How did, how did it work for you? And I know it's possible, and I know it won't be the end of the world. But I'm not going to lie and say it's not, it's not a hard thing to think about. So will you be able to communicate with your family when you're up there? I will. The IP phone, and as long as we have the uh, KU band antenna coverage, um, I'm hoping that every day, I don't know if that's unrealistic or not, but every day, call, call to my husband at least, and um, whether or not my three-year-old will be interested in talking voice on a phone, you know, maybe saying hello, mommy, and, um, but he may or may not be interested in, in talking on the phone. And then once a week, of course, we'll have the video conferences, and, and uh, as, as long as my, my husband has a mobile a mobile um, laptop or iPad where he can <laughs> chase around because I don't, I don't think my son will sit in front of a computer <laughs> to talk to me, but, but um, so there's, there's communication. What kinds of things do you think you'd show him, like on those video conferences? I, I really want to show him floating, things floating, me floating. Um, I think he'd get a kick out of it. I've thought about, you know, videotaping myself, eating lunch, <laughs> looking out the window, singing him, you are my sunshine, what, you know, the things that I would do if I were there and the things he would interact with me with while, while we're together. And so, so if I can find an efficient method of getting a video done every day, every other day, however many times, whatever makes sense at the time once I get there, and then... Uh, downlink them and, and get them to him. I think I think he would really like that. And it would it would make me feel good too. And it's a nice keepsake then when the mission is done. Hey, uh, welcome back to Mission Control Houston after that uh, video about Karen Nyberg and uh, a little peek into what it's like to be an astronaut with a family on the ground. We have with us today Doug Hurley, her husband, also an astronaut. Welcome, Doug. That's great to be here, Kelly. So, you know, there, there's, there's great things about being an astronaut and flying in space that I personally will never get to experience, but you guys both have had the opportunity to do that. Um, we're really curious about what it's like, though, when uh, your loved one is away for a long trip like this. You know, you're not, there are many, many people in this country, in this world, who have to spend long periods away from their family, armed forces folks uh, uh, in particular. Um, tell us a little bit about uh, what it's like to, to be away from, from your wife uh, for so long and how you manage uh, having a child, your son Jack, uh, on the ground when she's up there. Yeah, it's uh, obviously a question I get a lot. Um, you know, the first thing I'll say is the the military folks, you know, know this uh, very, very well. Uh, and obviously, having been in the Marine Corps for 25 years, uh, I experienced several deployments, but I wasn't married, didn't have kids. So this is a little different being on the other end of it as well, you know, being the one that's home. Um, you know, I understand, you know, why she she loves it so much loves the job because it's the same thing I do and 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 so that part of it is really easy uh, but I also understand the risks I also understand the you know the lengths of time the things that can happen um, but we have such a great support system here you know with the video conferences on on a weekly basis and and the IP phone so it's it's really good to stay connected really easy to stay connected so that part of it um, has been really nice, and, and we we have a great bunch of folks that, that support us through that, through the entire increment, and uh, that really makes a difference. Well, let's just focus this a little bit for the early days. How did you and Karen meet in the first place? Well, we were classmates, um, Ascans together in 2000, and, uh, you know, eventually that blossomed into something more. And, uh, you know, once again, I think, um, you know, we have – similar career goals we had similar backgrounds we grew up in very small towns uh, um, and and so we had a lot of common background if you if you will and then the other part of it was just you know she's an amazing person I, I mean she's beautiful she's smart uh, way smarter than the average bear I mean uh, especially for a marine fighter pilot and and you know it just we just hit it off from day one and it's been uh, wonderful ever since 
So uh, you and she have both flown shuttle flights and been apart from each other on short duration missions prior to this. Mm -hmm. uh, but now you're into a long duration mission. You have a son. Uh, tell us a little bit about Jack and how old he is and uh, how you guys have been dealing with that long distance parenting thing. Yeah, the uh, the training flow for long duration kind of prepares you for some of this because it, it starts, you know, two and a half or three years before the flight starts. So these little four, and I call them little, it's, uh, it's your perspective, I think. <laughs> uh, these little four, six, seven-week training trips get you at least somewhat prepared for this big trip, which is uh, ultimately ends up being close to seven months in our case because she had to leave to do a last training trip in Russia before even going to Kazakhstan for the launch, and then of course the five and a half months in orbit. So, it's uh, it, it helps get you ready for that. Um, and of course, you know, with today's modern conveniences of uh, iPads and Skype and FaceTime and those things, I think Jack from day one has been used to that. Um, I actually found out we were going to have Jack uh, just prior to flying on STS-127, which was my first flight, and. Uh, I watched her fly on STS-124. We had started dating by then in 2008. And uh, I told her when she got back that it was a lot easier to be the one on the rocket than the one watching somebody go. And, and I think most families would attest to that same thing. And I think there are folks in our office that, that you know, maybe don't appreciate that quite as much as uh, she and I do. So um, it is much easier being the one going into space uh, in that particular case than, than it is the one watching somebody go because you're the one that, you know, you have no control over your destiny at that point. It's all up to physics and, and, and what your spouse does. But it, 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 uh, it helped us get ready for this one, which obviously is a little different than a shuttle mission. You know, this, is a, this truly is a, a, a long-duration mission. It's a long time away, family separation, those kinds of things. So in the lead-up to it with the training, um, you know, we came up with ways, I think, like every family does when they're separated, to just kind of connect and stay connected and what worked, and, and, and then also trying to work around Jack's schedule, which obviously you can't, you know, with the time change and all those things, you can't manipulate his schedule. So Karen had to adjust, that, you know, her schedule for times that she wanted to talk to him or video with him. Okay. Well, so uh, chasing down a youngster Jack's age is not always easy. Can you tell us, can, can you give us a, a little insight into what it's like to prepare for one of those calls from Karen to make sure that they connect appropriately? Yeah. I, once again, I think part of it is just he's he's known this almost since he was old enough to, to remember anything. And so he's used to being able to talk to mom on an iPad. So that part of it is easy. I think the only difference now is, is we can't do this every day. We, we can do it weekly. But like I said, with the tremendous amount of support we get um, here, it, it, those video conferences are, are priceless. And of course, they're huge for Karen to just be able to interact with, with, a, with Jack. You know, having a, anybody who knows, uh, who's had young children um, knows that they change every day at this age and so it was very important to her obviously to stay connected with him as much as possible you know I'll typically send videos or pictures every day of Jack uh, to her and then she always sends a video down every night uh, for him that she makes so you know it's not without a lot of effort but it's obviously worth it because I think you know that way we will stay connected and, and there won't be that unfamiliarity that that I think sometimes, you know, with the military deployments happen where you can't stay disconnected. So we're really lucky in that in that regard. We are coming up on Karen's 1,000th uh, day, I believe. 100th day. 100th day. 100th I, think day. Yeah, 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 I think it's today. Yeah, it's today. it's today. And yeah. so uh, uh, we're actually looking at a picture of her live as she's working in the Kibo module of the International Space Station right now. Uh, uh, are you starting to count the days to when she comes home? <laughs> I'm not going to admit to anything uh, here, Kelly. Uh, but, yeah, obviously, you know, it feels like it's been 100 days for me. I, I'm sure for her it probably has gone by pretty fast. I, you know, remembering my shuttle flights, it, it just seemed like those missions went by in almost a blink of an eye. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I, I'd say there's a little bit of that. But, you know, I, I'm just so proud of what she's done and how she's represented herself and NASA. Uh, it's a great crew up there, you know, with Luca and Chris and, and Pavel uh, and everybody, uh, Fyodor. Um, so, and I think they're looking forward to, you know, obviously, uh, the next crew and then the nine folks they'll have there towards the end of the increment, um, 
going to be sad to see Chris go. And obviously, I know Chris pretty well because I flew with him on uh, SDS-127. So I'm sure he's kind of going through those those kind of the end of the mission, uh, you know, the tug of war between, yeah, I'm excited to go home, but it's going to be hard to leave this place. And I, I, I think if, if you've gotten the most out of your mission, that's how you're going to feel towards the end of it. Okay. Um, have uh, one last question uh, before we wrap this up. Have you have you had any incidents uh, with your son that that led to mom having to say, Jack, should he got to do this? Or has it gotten to that point, or or do you try and stay away from that kind of a thing? Well, yeah, I I think you know he he's I know all parents say this, but he's a pretty good kid, and uh, he's very adaptable to the kind of the way things have been. This is all he's ever known is, uh, you know. Uh, you know, he was born in, in February, and Karen was assigned to this flight in, in that, you know, a few months later in July, so, and started traveling, you know, overseas shortly thereafter. So he, since he was less than a year old, is just, this is all he's ever known. I think it's going to be more interesting to see what it's like in a couple of years when, you know, both of us are around all the time. <laughs> but uh, no, you know, he's been, he's been super, uh, and, and it's kind of hard. To, to do that, you know, by the time you have an episode or whatever, you know, anecdote you had to tell her, you know, by the time you see her again on the video conferences, it's there's already four or five things that's happened since then. So um, that's why I try to send pictures or videos of him every day just to, so she can just kind of see the progression of, you know, when, when she last saw him in, in late April to in November. Yeah, when she gets home, he'll have grown. I think he already has quite a bit. I, that's what I was trying to see if we could just say, hey, slow down a little bit. Don't grow too much more before she gets back. But uh, he's not listening. And I'm sure he'll have learned a lot, too. Yeah, some of it may be, yeah, probably his vocabulary may have gone uh, a little bit towards the Marine Corps, maybe a little more than it should. But other than that, he's, he's doing really well. All right. Well, Doug Hurley, thanks a whole lot for being with us here today and sharing this personal side of your uh, relationship with, with your uh, wife and your and your son uh, in this unusual set of circumstances. Uh, it's really nice of you and Karen to, to share this with uh, the folks out there who are interested in what it's like to, to be an astronaut and to uh, do all this important research on the space station. You guys make it possible to do that kind of thing with your sacrifices. And I know uh, the country appreciates what you're doing. Well, Thanks. I, you know, the the thing I'd like to just leave folks with is, you know, we're regular folks who have a really cool job, and uh, the rest of it is we're just like a couple working parents, just like everybody else is. So, um, you know, we just get to ride a rocket every now and again. All right. Doug Hurley, thanks a lot. And thanks, remember Kevin. that uh, you can keep track of uh, Karen Nyberg's flight on uh, the uh, uh, space station website at www.nasa.gov station. And you can follow her on Twitter at, at Astro Karen N. Uh, there's also lots of information on the International Space Station Facebook account uh, and elsewhere uh, available to you. And we'll keep you in track of her progress here on Space Station Live as well.
Houston Station on two. Go ahead on two. Hey, Hal, I was just wondering if I could start the Node 3 R&R &R Part 1, or if you'd prefer to wait until that more solid KU. This is Mission Control Houston. We've got a cool down limitation that uh, will expire at 1555, so we're on a hold till then. Uh, obviously, you could set up cameras or whatever else you'd like to do before then, or you can just look out the window and enjoy the view. Option B sounds good with five days left. Okay, it looks like we're just about in darkness, but maybe you can catch a few glimpses there of uh, Madagascar. This is Mission Control Houston. Uh, Hal Getzelman, the spacecraft communicator or Capcom here in Mission Control, sitting next to Scott Stover, the flight director and the leader of the team here, talking with Chris Cassidy about uh, a little bit of a, of a weight that uh, he needs to... Uh, to uh, hang off, uh, hold off on doing anything more as he's uh, uh, getting ready to do some uh, work aboard the International Space Station and get uh, ready for the uh, carbon dioxide removal system to be uh, prepared for this uh, valve change out. He's getting an extra few minutes to go off and look in the window as a result of that, uh, which is great news for him since he's uh, getting ready to lose that view in five days, as he mentioned, as uh, he and his uh, uh, fellow crewmates, Pavel Vinogradov and Alexander Mazurkin, prepare for a departure from the International Space Station on Tuesday, September the 10th. Again, we'll have uh, coverage of that on uh, uh, September the 10th, beginning at 3 p.m. with hatch closures. And uh, then landing coverage begins at 8.45 p.m. and landing is scheduled for just before 10 p.m. Central Time on uh, Tuesday, September the 10th. Meanwhile, uh, Karen Nyberg uh, is uh, continuing her work uh, in the space station with uh, the instruments in the Kibo module, that uh, Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency provided laboratory. Uh, and she is currently working uh, with one of the gradient heating furnace heating units. Uh, there is an insulation resistance measurement that needs to be performed, and she's working with that in the Kibo laboratory. Uh, we just talked with Doug Hurley, her husband and fellow astronaut, uh, who is uh, taking care of things at home while she's on orbit for four months. Today marks uh, Karen Nyberg's uh, 100th day in orbit, and uh, as uh, is a routine thing, there will probably be a celebration here on the ground. Normally, the uh, team that supports these increments will have a get-together in which they uh, recognize that, and uh, every now and then, the crew member who is uh, celebrating that 100 days on orbit will uh, call down on the uh, IP phone to say hello to the team in their off-duty hours. The Expedition 36 crew uh, woke up this morning at uh, about 2.30 a.m. Houston time, uh, went through a daily planning conference with uh, the teams on the ground in Houston and in uh, Moscow and Munich and Scuba Japan uh, to make sure everybody was uh, ready for the activities of the day. And here's a look uh, live uh, at the activities of Luca Parmitano uh, as he continues uh, his work aboard the space station, supporting uh, research and everything. He's uh, getting ready to do some work with uh, the automated uh, transfer vehicle that's docked to the far end of the International Space Station. That's the next thing on his schedule, uh, doing an oxygen pressurization. Uh, that uh, cargo vehicle remains uh, docked to the station. It was used uh, last weekend to raise the altitude of the station to uh, put it in the proper orbit for the upcoming uh, undocking and departure. We see him talking with Chris Cassidy uh, in this view right here. Temporarily lost some of our uh, television downlink, but if 
everything's fine aboard the International Space Station. As I mentioned, the crew went through a daily planning conference early in the day, uh, and then they moved into the meat of their work uh, for uh, Pavel Vinogradov and his Russian colleagues. It was uh, preliminary work with the lower body negative pressure device, which is uh, a uh, attempt to help to uh, defray the detrimental effects of long duration stays in space by using negative pressure to pull fluids down into the lower extremities of the International Space Station. Uh, that's something the uh, Russian cosmonauts still do. Uh, that was tested some in the shuttle program uh, and uh, uh, determined to be, uh, at least for U.S. astronauts, not as effective as we had hoped. And so we rely more on continuous exercise during the uh, expedition and diet to help uh, keep uh, astronauts from losing too much uh, bone or muscle density, uh, which are uh, the key uh, adversaries uh, in uh, low Earth orbit for astronauts. There are other ta challenges, uh, such as uh, radiation exposure and, and vision changes, uh, but uh, those are some of the more long-term health hazards that uh, are posed by long-duration spaceflight. And uh, the team uh, in Houston and elsewhere around the world has uh, come up with some pretty good countermeasures uh, through a combination of exercise and diet. Uh, they have made vast strides in keeping that uh, from uh, being as big of a problem as it was, looking forward toward longer and longer a flight to uh, farther destinations in the future. But uh, for now, the Russians are getting ready for some uh, lower body negative pressure training. Uh, they're also doing a lot of uh, packing and stowing, uh, getting ready for uh, the departure, along with Chris Cassidy that's coming up on Tuesday. Also early in the day, uh, Luca Parmentano uh, did a lot of work with the SPHERES experiment. Again, uh, SPHERES stands for Synchronized Position Hold engage, and reorient, and experimental satellites, or spheres. And secure those valves. And these are bowling ball sized, uh, pretty much round spherical satellites that are used inside the space station. Uh, the free flying spheres uh, orient themselves relative to one another, and these tests uh, involve the use of uh, a uh, smartphone to uh, work with that. In addition, uh, now that we are temporarily out of uh, connection with the space station for a television downlink, let's take this opportunity to look uh, at some training for an upcoming space station expedition. Uh, expedition 40 uh, crew members, Reed Wiseman and Alexander Gerst, uh, Wiseman of NASA and uh, Gerst of the European Space Agency, are uh, in the Neutral Buoyancy Laboratory pool, uh, about 20 minutes away from here from uh, Mission Control Houston. Uh, the pool is uses a technique called neutral buoyancy, uh, where the astronauts uh, practicing spacewalks are neither floating nor sinking, but holding steady in the, in, in the world. Uh, inside the water there, they use uh, real spacesuits uh, with uh, mock-up backpacks and umbilicals so that they can uh, practice tax tests and techniques that they'll be using uh, either in planned spacewalks or uh, to be ready for a contingency spacewalk uh, should uh, something go wrong on the extra of the space station needs a repair activity. This is Alexander Gerst here, uh, again uh, at the Sunny Carter Training Facility in the Neutral Buoyancy Laboratory pool practicing uh, spacewalking activities.
the uh, activities are working on today in terms of uh, uh, practice sessions are uh, some maintenance tasks that could be needed. Here they're working with a uh, what's known as a pistol grip tour tool, and uh, this is a uh, essentially an uh, electro uh, a uh, electronic drill that's cordless, and it's used for a lot of the uh, multiple turn activities uh, for uh, uh, either loosening or tightening bolts uh, outside the International Space Station. You can all see the hand of one of the support divers doing some of the work that the uh, mock-ups will not allow the crew members to do uh, to be ready for uh, the situation. These uh, folks maintain a close watch on the uh, extravehicular mobility unit uh, crew members uh, to make sure that they are safe underwater and ready to uh, get them out of the water if there should become be an issue with their spacesuit. They also help uh, in uh, setting up the uh, locations and the work that's being done uh, as part of the uh, activity uh, when it is beyond the uh, capabilities of the uh, simulated uh, spacewalkers to take care of that kind of thing. Just a reminder that there is more programming on NASA television today as uh, the team gets ready for a uh, launch of the Laddie spacecraft, which will be doing some uh, uh, amazing work as it is launched from the uh, Wallops uh, Space Flight Facility uh, in uh, Virginia and headed for the moon. Uh, Laddie is uh, being designed to study the, uh, uh, the moon dust or exo atmosphere, the small, very minimal atmosphere around the moon, uh, and in addition we'll be doing some uh, early testing of potential laser communication systems. Uh, we'll have a LADI pre-launch briefing with uh, a lot of the different uh, details of that coming up at 2 p.m. Central Time, 3 p.m. Eastern, and then at uh, 3 p.m. Central, 4 Eastern, we'll move on to the LADI Mission Science and Technology Demonstration Briefing, uh, also uh, out of the WALPS flight facility, uh, that will discuss in detail the scientific objectives and plan for that upcoming mission. Uh, the LADI mission is uh, flying out of the same uh, launch pad that, uh, or launch site uh, that the upcoming uh, Orbital Sciences uh, uh, Demonstration Flight will be flying. 
And uh, so we're watching carefully to make sure that Laddie gets off the ground on schedule uh, so that uh, we can look forward to the next cargo demonstration mission to the International Space Station uh, by the Orbital Sciences Cygnus spacecraft. Uh, that launch uh, currently scheduled for September the 17th, assuming everything goes well with Laddie's upcoming launch. Next on NASA TV will be the video file from NASA headquarters at 11 a.m. Central Time. And we'll be back with more Space Station Live tomorrow at 10 a.m. This is Mission Control Houston.